Hello, everybody. Um, welcome along to today's session. Um, you're with Rochelle Park and Cassandra Scott. Cass has kindly um, spent some time this morning putting together um, some information uh, around the um, monthly declaration. So we'll go to that very shortly. Just give people the opportunity to enter the room. We've got over 260 participants today. So we just need to give it a moment for everyone to have time to enter. Hi everyone coming into the room. We're just going to give it a moment uh, for everyone to have the opportunity to enter the webinar. Hello everybody as you come in. Um, to the session, just a note that we're waiting for everyone to have an opportunity to join us. Okay, those numbers seem to have steadied now, so we might get things going. As I mentioned before, you're with um, Rochelle Park and Cassandra Scott today. Um, Cass has kindly put together some information for us, some screenshots around the monthly declaration process and has a few important um, points to make for you. Um, I think before we get into that detail, I just wanted to make the point that we um, distributed a um, authority to lodge the monthly declaration yesterday and I've actually updated that overnight due to some member feedback and we've um, put that update on the website and I'll also email out at some stage today either a link to that or, or reattach that authority to lodge. I just think it's really important to um, highlight the need to hold that authority to lodge before you jump in and start this application process, because, oh, sorry, declaration process, because the ATL have pointed out to us that this um, form will not save. You cannot jump out and jump back into it. So you need to make sure that you've got all of the information at hand um, and very importantly, including that authority to lodge so that you are um, you're meeting the requirements as per the code of conduct. So without further ado, Cass, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us today. So what we're going to be stepping through is just a, a quick brief overview about where we are within the JobKeeper process and then focusing on what the requirements are for the monthly reporting. Um, so as you're aware, part of the, the uh, protocol behind JobKeeper is that business owners must provide a report to the ATO um, no later than the seventh day of the month following um, the reporting month. Um, advising uh, eligible employees and the turnover for the prior month plus uh, projected turnover. Now there is an exception to that for the month of April where the reporting has been extended through to the 31st of May. So please don't panic that you do need to get everything for April done by the 7th of, of May. You don't, you do have the extension on that. So in terms of JobKeeper, um, where we are at the moment. Um, so the, the key steps that we've, we've been through to date or should be stepping through to date are uh, firstly assessing the client's eligibility and there's two parts to that. One is firstly do they meet the requirements of being an eligible employer and a subset of that is actually the turnover test. Now in the last uh, week or so there have been some additional um, uh, tests, alternate tests 
published by the ATO uh, and the ATO website has been recently updated to provide some working examples of those. So if you've got clients that haven't yet um, registered for JobKeeper but they do believe or you may believe that they are eligible, you can run them through the, the turnover tests and the first ones to look at would be the basic tests and the second ones to look at would be the alternate tests. Um, so there are a number of different, different ones that may be applicable to you and your client specific circumstances. Once it's deemed that your uh, employer is eligible and meets the turnover, decline in turnover requirements, you're then looking obviously at um, assessing the employee eligibility um, and issuing the employees an employee nomination notice. Employees are required to return that notice uh, to the employer before they, they're um, able to be registered as eligible employees for JobKeeper purposes. Obviously, once you've got an eligible employer, eligible employees, then you can jump onto the online services for agents site and finalize the registration for your clients at that point in time and then the only other requirement is to ensure that all eligible employees are paid a minimum of $1,500 per job keeper fortnight so just to qualify as well for um, the first two fortnights in April the ATO has extended uh, the payment date for those to the 8th of May so if you have an employer that still wants to qualify for uh, fortnight one and fortnight two in April uh, they can still register now and as long as they've made payment to the employees of the minimum prior to the 8th of May they will still be eligible for the JobKeeper subsidy for the first two fortnights. So the final uh, step in the process and this is the the key step because this is the that triggers the, the bucks to the bank account is undertaking the monthly reporting requirements and what we're going to do is step through some of the screens that you'll see. So we're going to be uh, assuming, and, and I'm sorry, I don't have a live demo because obviously it's client sensitive information. So what we will be working on here is screenshots. Um, the other thing I should say too, if you do have any questions about this, can you please put them in the Q&A box uh, in the Zoom meeting, not in the chat box. And we will be looking at, um, Rochelle will be answering some of the questions throughout as, as we're moving through, but we'll save all questions until the very end. So when you log into online services to agents and navigate to your client, um, you would see a, a view button here. And this is where you would have gone in the first instance to actually register your client for uh, the JobKeeper subsidy. So if you haven't already, this is what you'd be looking at. From there, you'll actually come onto a second screen. Now, if you haven't already registered your client for the JobKeeper subsidy, you'll have a step through process to go through. We actually have done that previously, so I'm not going to restate that here again. Sorry, Cass, can I just jump in there? I've just, we've just had a request if you can um, zoom up your PDF a, a little bit larger. Yeah, sure. Does that help? That's much better. Thanks, Cass. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So if you've got your client already enrolled, you will see that visible here. So there may be situations where your clients have actually enrolled themselves directly. If that's the case, it will be immediately visible that the client has, has done that or they are already enrolled. The next part of the process is there's actually two parts to the monthly reporting. And the first one is identifying and maintaining your employees eligible for JobKeeper. And then the second uh, part of that is the monthly declaration um, that needs to be made. Now, as Rochelle stated, there's a few key things to be aware of, and I can't overstate this enough. You cannot save the form while in progress. So if you think you can save it, um, do a heap of work in it, come back later and finish it, you can't. Um, understand that the ATO has actually rolled these out in a very, very short time frame. So unfortunately, they haven't had the opportunity to put those nice things in that we, we would hope we you can save and return to at a later point. Um, if you do dump out of it, you will need to start from scratch again. Uh, the other thing to be aware of is once the form has been submitted, you cannot edit the information. Uh, there is a possibility that the ATO may enable this down the track, but at this point in time, that's one piece of functionality that's not been built into the process. Um, and when you do submit the form, you will be given the option to print out a receipt. And we'll, we'll see an example of that as we step through this. Now, again, be aware that if you don't print the receipt out at that stage, you cannot go back later and redo. Um, 
I know we're all sort of really hectic trying to get things out the door for our clients, but my advice to you would be just to step through this in a calm manner and just follow the steps. And after the first couple, you will get very, very familiar with the, the process and the questions and the language that's being used. Um, and make sure you do print the receipts out at the end because that's a great record for your working papers about what has physically been lodged for the client as well. So once you click through identity, you'll move on to another screen. Now, this screen is a lot of words. And basically, everything on this screen is just restating all of the eligibility requirements um, for employer eligibility, employee eligibility. It's talking about um, what we've just chatted about before. You can't save the form and resume later. It's about information that you may need to have on hand prior to lodging. So a key point of note, if you've not um, undertaken any STP lodgements for any of your clients. So none of the wages have been reported via STP. So they may be closely held or a, a micro employer. Um, you will need the employee's uh, name, date of birth and tax file number to proceed. Seed. So you need to have that on hand before you start going through. Uh, again, if you've got a business with more than 200 employees, um, there is a file transfer process that can be used or it must be undertaken through STP software. Um, anything else, they're generally expecting to see the information moving through to the portals via an STP lodgement. And again, when we're talking STP lodgements, I can't stress enough that the lodgement that you process via STP must be a lodgement that includes the JobKeeper start dates um, and also if, if required, the JobKeeper top up. So uh, depending on the accounting software that you're using, they have specific processes that they require you to follow to ensure that the JobKeeper codes are correctly picked up in the payroll processing so that they can be correctly uh, included in the STP lodgements that are sent through to the ATO. Again, restating employer eligibility criteria, employee eligibility criteria. There's actually nothing on this screen that you'll be required to input. It is just for information only. You would then be clicking on next. So the next thing that you'll come up with is um, this screen here, if you have originally nominated an eligible business participant. So there's, there's three general scenarios that most businesses will, will fit into. One is they will just be an eligible business participant. The other is they will just have eligible employees. But there are also situations where you will have an eligible business participant plus eligible employees. So you'll see a mix of these screens depending on which one of the scenarios that you actually do fit into. So if you have um, a business that's nominated an eligible business participant, this is the first screen that you will see. Now, unfortunately, some of the language hasn't quite been refined yet. This does say eligible employees, but this screen is actually relating to eligible business participants. Um, the first thing you'll be asked to do is actually select which month you're applying for the JobKeeper wage subsidy. So assuming your businesses have all been registered from day one or eligible from day one, you'll be selecting April, which will reflect fortnights one and fortnight two. Again, it's restating the eligible uh, criteria for the business participant. And you will be asked here again, do you want to identify a business participant? So you're either going to be saying yes to that or no, you won't. Now, if you do select yes to um, an eligible business participant, you'll get this additional information that comes up. If at the point of registering the business, you had provided the tax file number and the details of the eligible business participant, this will be pre-filled with those details. If you didn't nominate the eligible business participant when you registered, you do have the opportunity to add them in here and actually provide their tax file number and date of birth. So this all cross references back to the ATO systems around tax file numbers. Um, and again, then you'll also be required to nominate the fortnight that the JobKeeper payments are to commence. So that's what you'll see if you are an eligible business participant. If you don't have an eligible business participant for the business, um, this screen won't become available. What we move on to next is eligible employees. And this is the screen that you will see if you have eligible employees 
and you have lodged an STP pay event that has included JobKeeper codes. So if you've lodged um, an event that hasn't got JobKeeper codes, you'll see something different. Now what you'll see on this screen is eligible employees per JobKeeper fortnight and it will have these two fields automatically populated. This information is being extracted from the data that you have lodged via STP and will be picking up the JobKeeper fortnight one start date um, for any eligible employees that you've nominated. If you're in a situation where when you're having a look at this and you know that the business has four eligible employees um, but it's only picking up two in here, what I would recommend you do is go back and have a look at your STP lodgements and ensure that the STP lodgements that you have submitted do include all eligible employees. So I have seen situations where people have um, um, added on new employees, uh, they've submitted the, done the, the JobKeeper top-ups, they've submitted those via STP, but they've actually not done an STP submission for employees that are earning more than the $1,500 and are eligible. Um, and if that's the case, you, you might only see two in here until you, you formally submit via STP all eligible employees. Now, if you get to this point and you find that there are only two eligible employees and you're expecting four, go back, relodge your STP. It's going to take um, probably an overnight before it will update in here. The ATO did advise it, advise it could be 48 hours. Um, I did one yesterday myself where I, I wasn't seeing the correct number and it was there this morning. So allowed at least an overnight to update um, post STP lodgement um, or it could be up to 48 hours. So assuming this information is correct, so the number of eligible employees per fortnight here matches what you were expecting to see based on your pay runs. Um, what you'll next get is this summary screen here where it will tell you what the employee claim for each of those period is, periods is and then what the wage subsidy will be that you are going to be entitled to. So obviously if there's an eligible business participant in here there'll be a number one and these numbers will actually change um, to reflect that as well. Now there's been a little bit of confusion about some of these warnings that are popping up here. Employee details required. Um, if you read the JobKeeper guides around these, it does state that the employee details will have already been submitted to the ATO if you had triggered an STP lodgement with a pay event. So there are concerns that um, people are expecting to add additional information in here. That's not the case. If the information has already been submitted via STP, this is the only information that you will see. Moving on, if you haven't submitted uh, a JobKeeper code through an STP pay event, but you've previously lodged STP um, with the ATO, so the, the wording here is reported to the ATO via STP on the 1st of March 2020. This is a situation where it will give you a list of employees. So basically what this, this page will be saying to you is as at the 1st of March 2020, we had received STP lodgements from your business for all of these employees and that we've not received a subsequent STP lodgement that triggers any of the JobKeeper codes. If this is the case, you'll be you'll have the list of all of the employees and their tax file numbers. This will all be pre-populated from any prior STP reports you've lodged. And what you'll then have here on the right hand side is the option to nominate the employees. And you'll be given uh, five different options. Um, never eligible. So that's an employee that's uh, perhaps a casual that um, hasn't met the criteria, has indicated that they're in receipt of JobKeeper from another uh, employee could be somebody that's on paid parental leave. Um, sorry, if they're on paid parental leave, you'd probably put in not claiming yet because the option is that they will be eligible to claim down the track. But somebody that's never eligible, you've got the option of not claiming yet, uh, claiming fortnights one and two or claiming just fortnight one or claiming just fortnight two. So you will need to select that. Um, the other point to note is 
this is only going to be available in the April submission. Uh, the expectation is prior to that, if you have STP enabled uh, software, you will be reporting all of your JobKeeper pay events via STP. So this is the, the one opportunity that if you haven't already reported via STP, you can pick these up manually. You also do have the ability to add other eligible employees. So say you had an employee that started um, in late February and for whatever reason has never been picked up in an STP lodgement um, or perhaps they're uh, a closely held employee, this is where you can manually enter them in as well. And again, what you would need to provide is their name, address, date of birth and tax file number because this information is correlating back to that. Moving on, once you've got all of your employees listed, the next piece of information that's going to be requested is the GST turnover of the entities. So again, it will restate what the subsidy is that you're going to be eligible to eligible for. Um, and then it's going to be asking you for your GST turnover. Now it will be asking for the April, the actual April GST turnover and the projected May turnover figures. Now when you're providing these turnover figures, they should be provided on the same basis that you used to determine the eligibility of the employer um, for JobKeeper subsidy. So if you made the determination based on a, a cash basis, use cash basis when you're reporting your turnover figures. If you used it on an accruals basis, um, then please use an accruals um, figure when you're reporting these figures. Um, GST turnover, X GST, the ATO website has some fabulous information about what does and does not um, get included into GST turnover. So for instance, things like the cash flow boost will be excluded from um, GST turnover if you're, you're providing this information. Um, there's been a number of questions that have been asked about how do we determine the May GST turnover. We don't know what's going to be happening, but what happens if businesses open up and they, they lift the bands? Um, when you're making the projection on May GST turnover, you are making the projection on the status of the business at the point in time that you're making the turnover. So if um, there's been no advice come through and it's purely speculation that businesses may be able to reopen in one week, three weeks, six weeks, disregard that because until it actually happens, uh, it's, it's not anything that can be factored into the decisions about what the projected turnover estimates are. So those projected figures should be based on the information you have about the business at this, this particular point in time, based on the economic environment that we have at this particular point in time. Um, this information also, the, the clients I would strongly recommend um, have involvement in providing you. Um, you. You might assist the clients in, you know, how do we get this information? What, what metrics do we use? But fundamentally, the client is the one that needs to be um, assisting you in providing their uh, projected May turnover figures. They're the ones that know their business. They're the ones that understand what's happening in the actual business on a a day-to-day -day basis. They know what they're doing with their clients or not doing with their clients as it may be for some businesses. So please make sure the clients are involved in this process um, and have confirmed that the figures that you are actually going to be lodged here are true and correct. Just in addition to that, Cass, um, I just wanted to stress again that you only have to um, pass the turnover test once. Yes eligibility and you're in the system until September even if your um, revenue increases I think there's been some confusion about that some might be stressed as to why the ATO is asking for this information here um, and we um, did pose that question in the meeting that Cass talked about last week and the ATO told us that um, basically the government are interested in having um, as live data as they possibly can and not waiting to a quarterly basis to understand what's happening in the Australian economy. Yeah, absolutely agree, Rochelle. And look, the ATO unfortunately haven't helped themselves because the language that's in this question says you must reconfirm the eligibility of your business um, and your reported eligible employees. So it, it's a bit, bit misleading in the way it's worded, but absolutely uh, any of the ATO information that you're reading regarding this report in the monthly um, process is not to... Um, 
deem you ineligible, it is just a, it just a statistical figure. So uh, please reassure yourselves and reassure your clients um, that this won't kick them out of, of JobKeeper subsidy eligibility. Obviously, if there's been any um, manipulation of data um, to trigger eligibility or any schemes that have been entered in, all bets are off. Um, and the other thing I, I guess to be aware of is you know, you are reporting actual turnover here. Um, the ATO does have a number of integrity measures and in fact, they, they've really um, ramped up the integrity uh, around the JobKeeper subsidy process and uh, diverted a number of their investigative resources to the system and ensuring that the integrity of the system has been maintained. Um, you know, I, I would expect that at some point in time, this data may be looked at as a sub element of any review of data may may be um, so you know with your clients you want to be getting it as well, april should be easy to to reflect as correct but you, you know your turnovers need to be based on reasonable assessments of, of what is actually happening in the business at this point in time um, and as agents we've got a requirement to be able to demonstrate reasonable care in any of the information that we're submitting to the ATO. Um, okay so moving forward once you've um, added your turnover information in uh, you'll have financial institution details now these will be the institution details the FIDs that you actually um, uh, entered in when you registered the client for JobKeeper. Obviously, if anything's changed, you will have the ability to um, edit that. And then the final point in this form is actually the declaration. And this is the declaration that you are making as an agent, that you've prepared the document in accordance with the information supplied by the entity. So really important that the entity is actually signing off on any of the information that you are planning to submit. Um, also that the entity is stating that the information is true and correct. So they're providing that information to you um, as, a, as a legal fact. Um, obviously, you still need to apply your, your standards of reasonable care. So we can't abrogate our responsibilities of it as agents against reasonable care. Um, but the entity is making the statement around true and correct and that you are authorised by the entity to provide this information to the commissioner. Um, once you're happy with that, tick that and hit submit. And from that point on, you'll then be uh, given the opportunity to print out a lodgement receipt. So this is the information that's included in the lodgement receipt. It will show the date it's been submitted. There will be a receipt number, um, the month of submission, so it's April. If there was an eligible business participant, that information would be included in here. You can see the number of employees and the wage subsidy. Now, for anybody that's questioning why I had number four in an earlier screen and I've only got one here, here. Um, the earlier screen was a client I hadn't yet lodged for. This is one that I had lodged for. So it's a hodgepodge of different clients that I've pulled together to give you the information. Um, GST turnover reported. There we go. And pretty much that's it for the monthly reporting process. So it, it looks like it's complicated and there's a number of screens to step through and there's, you know, particularly looking at this, there's a, a lot of information that appears to be passed through to you. But once you do it and you've got all of the information at hand, um, it's actually not a long, long process at all. I've done about three or four at the moment for my clients and I'm doing them in between five and 10 minutes per client. Um, you know, probably by the time I've extracted their turnover figures, uh, sent the information to the client, for their um, authorization to get their projections on any of the May turnover figures. It's probably no more than about 15 to 30 minutes per client in total, including the lodgement process. So it's actually not, um, I, I don't believe it's an onerous task. Certainly if you have not yet started reporting through STP and you're needing to collect this information, um, there will be some additional work uh, required. Um, and one of the things I would recommend is if you do have employees who are uh, deemed closely held or who perhaps fall into the micro category, this may be a good opportunity to um, have a conversation with them around 
around bringing them into the STP reporting framework. So just as a, a note on STP, um, it was going to be a requirement as at the 30th of June this year that all businesses would move over to STP. Uh, the ATO have now deferred that to um, 30th of June 2021, which is fabulous. Um, however, I would strongly encourage anybody who's not yet reporting employees through STP um, to consider bringing them onto STP enabled software from this point forward if you can. It'll just make the process so much easier. Okay, um, I'm just gonna have a look at some of the questions that are in there. Has there been anything um, come through, Rochelle, that's specific? So I'm just having a look now. Would the client have to lodge the March BAS before applying for JobKeeper? No, there's actually no requirement to have the March BAS lodged before JobKeeper can be applied for. Um, that's uh, cash flow boat cash flow boost is what's dependent on the March BAS. There is no requirement for it to have been lodged for JobKeeper eligibility. Um, can a first year apprentice be an eligible employee? Absolutely they can. So if they meet the requirements for an eligible employee, um, they can be eligible for JobKeeper. Um, the question probably to ask there is if the employer is already in receipt of the apprentice subsidy that's available. If they are in receipt of the apprentice subsidy, uh, they would need to look at ceasing the apprentice subsidy if they wanted to bring the employee on as an eligible employee for JobKeeper purposes. Um, so just answering those. If step two is done through your STP software, would we just have to do step three? Um, yes, so if through the STP software, you've got this here, step two only, um, it would, you won't be required to do this here. You would just then jump to the turnover declarations. So you will only be required to provide employee information or deal with this screen if you haven't lodged an STP pay event with JobKeeper codes um, included in that pay event. Um, if you have to do STP, do you need to do step two? I think we've just clarified that one. When an employer notifies employee start dates via STP, I'm having trouble finding a list of employees to check off during this process, although I'm able to see the number of employees. Um, Eric, that may depend on the accounting software that you're using. So some of the accounting software, it's actually really obvious about which employees have been nominated for STP purposes um, and which haven't. So I would go back and have a chat to the software provider about that one. Uh, GST free sole trader, can I please explain? Uh, Debbie, I'm not quite sure what the context of your question is. Would you mind um, providing further context around that please? Uh, do all employees need to be on JobKeeper or only those affected by reduction in funding be registered? Uh, the JobKeeper subsidy is a one in, all in. So a business must nominate all employees that meet the eligibility criteria. An employee does not need to accept the nomination. So if you are an eligible business participant and you have employees, you must, and you're nominating as an eligible business participant, you must also nominate all eligible employees. If you don't, you will not be eligible for the JobKeeper subsidy. So um, if you have an employee base and uh, for whatever reason you don't want to be paying JobKeeper to those, then you would need to formally terminate those employees. And if you do go through a formal termination process, you need to make sure that the requirements of fair work are actually adhered to regarding um, employment termination. If it's not done appropriately, the employer may be subject to unfair dismissal. Uh, does screen five only come up in certain circumstances? I didn't see it when looking for an employee list yesterday. Yes, so this one here, which has got um, the employee list on it, will only appear if you've reported via STP, but have not reported an STP 
pay run with job keeper codes. So if um, say you're using zero, for instance, and in zero you've nominated all of your eligible employees and you've gone back and you've done your unscheduled pay runs or your top up pay runs and they've all been lodged via STP, this is the screen that you will see. You will not see this screen here. You will only see this if there's been STP lodgements that have not included any JobKeeper codes. Uh, can you amend your turnover fix? No, you can't. If you need to do that, you'll need to contact the ATO. Sorry, the question, I'm reading the question and answering it. Um, can you amend your turnover figures for April and May if you have already submitted? No, you can't. If you have submitted this document, um, you will need to contact the ATO directly. It cannot be edited on this document. Uh, sole trader BAS agent, have myself and my client list. How do I process for JobKeeper payment? Um, Angeline, you would have nominated as an eligible business participant. Um, if you haven't nominated as an eligible business participant, uh, you will need to do so in the first instance. And then when you come back in to do the monthly report, this is the screen that you will be dealing with. Um, if you've got no employees, you will just see this screen here and then you'll be required to provide your turnover figures down here, you won't see anything else regarding employees. Um, and once you've processed that, that will, uh, that will be the trigger. Uh, a working director of a company and not on STP, how do they report and receive JobKeeper? Again, that will be done through here. So they would have nominated themselves as an eligible, employ uh, eligible business participant when they registered for JobKeeper. Um, and when they come into here, uh, if they haven't provided their tax file numbers and date of birth, that's where that information will be. Uh, does the JobKeeper payment come into the GST turnover figure? No, the JobKeeper payment doesn't come into the GST turnover figure. Uh, does the GST turnover figure include the GST or not? Uh, no, it doesn't. But if you do refer to the JobKeeper website, um, there's very, very specific information about what is included and excluded from the turnover figures. I'm not going to step through that here. Um, I'd encourage you to review that and um, read accordingly. Uh, with regards to eligible business participant, is the tax file number that of the business or the individual? It's actually the tax file number of the individual um, when we're talking about the eligible business participant. So if the eligible business participant is a sole trader, um, the JobKeeper subsidy will be paid to the sole trader and it will be recognised as income directly to the, um, the sole trader individual. If the eligible business participant is um, part, a participant of a company or a trust, the monies will be paid to the company or the trust. And interestingly, there's actually no requirement in a company or a trust structure for that entity to pass those funds on to the eligible business participant. However, it is the eligible business participants um, individual tax file number and date of birth that must be recorded. Um, any idea on how long after lodgement payment will be made by the ATO? Look, um, they're talking seven days, seven to 14 days, short answer, no idea. And uh, once we see it hit the account, we'll know it's been paid. Uh, what happens if your projected turnover makes eligibility but actual doesn't? Um, Susan, if you're talking about monthly reporting in the in here, um, it's not an eligibility piece of information. It's um, just a statement of figures. You would have determined your eligibility before you registered for JobKeeper in the first place. Um, so, you know, if you've got any further questions around that, please address those separately offline. But um, turnover in this context has no impact on eligibility. Uh, when you are a payroll only on online services, can you still enrol your client? Yes, you can. 
Uh, if an employer is not eligible for April 2020, but determines that they are eligible for May, do we still include April turnover and projected May turnover? The employee intends to register for JobKeeper from May only. No, so the report that we're dealing with at the moment is only for April. So if the business has not become eligible until the May JobKeeper fortnights, they will not be reporting any of the April information. Uh, does sole traders information entered into eligible business participants details area? Yes, it does. As we were talking about, this is where the sole trader information is entered in here. Uh, can, a, can a client pull out of the JobKeeper after they have registered or during any time? Um, great question. I believe they can. I don't know specifically how they would do it. Uh, if you're talking it about an employer, uh, what they would do in that situation is, is use a job keeper finish date in an employer record, which would flag to the ATO that um, there is no longer a job keeper subsidy to be paid for that employer. Um, similarly, for an eligible business participant, you would need to let them know that you are not wishing to be in receipt of the job keeper sub subsidy. Um, the question would be around that is is why, um, but you should be able to withdraw from the process. Um, so once you view the lodgement receipt, you can't go back and change anything. Um, in fact, once you hit submit, so irrespective of the lodgement receipt, once you hit submit, you cannot go back and change anything. So as we've stated a couple of times, uh, please step through the process carefully, do it with a clear head, take your time because no, once you, you've done it, you cannot go back and change it. Uh, does the business participant get the money personally paid to their personal account or does the business retain it? I think we've answered that one a few moments ago. Uh, what's the approximate margin of fluctuation for the downturn, 30%? So again, if we're talking about the uh, monthly report, there is no fluctuation that, that's taken into account. If you're talking about initial registration and eligibility um, for the client to register, um, the requirement is a 30% or greater decline. So 29.71% is not 30%. Uh, so if you're talking about registration, it is 30%. Um, we've not seen any information from the ATO whether or not near enough is good enough. Um, the instructions are very, very clear, it's 30%. Uh, when does this have to be lodged by? So um, generally when we're doing the monthly submissions, they will be required to be lodged with the ATO as it stands today. And, and please understand the ATO may change this uh, moving forward. But the way it stands today, the lodgements need to be with the ATO by the 7th um, after end of month, with the exception of April, which is the one that we're working on at the moment, and you do have until the 31st of May to finalise that one. Um, did I understand right that I can pick up the first fortnight for my client report here in the reporting and pay the difference until the 8th of May? Okay, so one of the um, eligibility requirements is that um, the employees must have been paid the 1500 so here we go when we're looking at the employee information. The employer must have paid an employee $1,500 or more for the JobKeeper fortnight for the employee to be eligible. So there seems to be some discussion out there that if you lodge your JobKeeper form today but don't pay them till the 8th of May, um, that you will be eligible. The requirements are that the employee must be paid before this form can be lodged because part of the statement that you're making is that the employee has actually been paid um, and JobKeeper is a reimbursement, it's not a payment in advance. Uh, do we follow the same process for us as a business owner? Yes, we're not a BAS agent with clients. Yes, absolutely. So the, the key difference as a business owner will be the declaration that you're signing down below. Um, the wording on here is specifically for registered agents. As a business owner, you'll be making a similar declaration, but as the owner of the entity. So yeah, the information workflows will be exactly the same. Um, can you please clarify the edge of eligible business participant if the business owner is actually receiving a wage? If the business owner is an employee, then they are not an eligible business participant. So they would be treated as an employee and reported as an employee um, for the purposes of JobKeeper subsidy. So you can be one or the other, but you can't be both. 
Um, if you have a not-for-profit that has a large amount of GST free income like fees, there will be no drop in GST. How do you show eligibility? Please refer to the uh, tests. There has been some, some specific information released regarding not-for-profits and their funding base. Uh, I'm not going to go into specific details about not-for-profits here. Um, there is a lot of information on the ATO website about how turnover is to be determined uh, depending on the entities. Um, I've already sent out an authorisation form at the beginning of this process. Will I need to send out another authorisation form for this stage? So at the beginning of the process, you would have sent out an authorisation form to your clients that basically gave you authority to act on their behalf and to register them for the JobKeeper subsidy and to take action in that regard. No different than when you're engaging with a client and they're authorising you to act as their, their BAS agent for the provision of services. So the authorisations that we need here are a second authorisation and this is the authorisation to lodge this information with the ATO. No different than requiring an authorisation from a client to lodge an activity statement or a tax file number declaration or any other document for and on your behalf, uh, for and on behalf of the client to the ATO. So you cannot have a blanket authority for these lodgements. Um, it must be a, an authority per lodgement. Are directors considered to be eligible business participants? Um, yes, they may be. So please uh, refer to the information about sole traders and other entities on the JobKeeper website. That will actually step you through the um, how directors may be deemed to be eligible business participants. Uh, we've already talked about when payments will hit 